Welcome back to Istanbul for the second part of Europe District. I'm standing in front of the landmark of the Turkish city, the Blue Mosque. In this part of the program will travel to Belgium to meet members of the large Turkish diaspora and take you for a walk through the streets and back streets of Istanbul, a delightful city full of surprises. But in our first story, we travel to the border with Syria, where over 120,000 refugees are sheltering in Turkish camps. Such an influx of refugees caused alarm here in Turkey, where the authorities are increasingly concerned about their ability to cope with the situation. This is a report from our correspondent, Asya Shihab. It's a year and a half since Turkey started accepting Syrian refugees on its territory. Their number now stands at 120,000, a figure that's doubled since July this year. These people have left everything behind to live in tents. Uncomfortable, it may be, but it's safe. A delegation from the European Parliament and the Turkish Justice Minister are visiting one of 14 camps in southern Turkey to see firsthand how Ankara is supporting the refugees. <laughs> They help us a lot. They give us what we need to live. Food, medical supplies, even an education. So far, the cost of the Turkish state is around 200 million euros. The Syrian refugees do appreciate the help, though they're sorry that their children have to follow the Turkish curriculum. Lessons in Arabic are almost non-existent. As winter approaches, heavy rain has started falling in the region. In the more recently constructed camps, refugees live in prefabricated container homes, but others live in tents. As the temperature drops, their frustration rises. The Turkish government and Mr. Erdogan, I respect them, but we have a corrupt government and Bashar al-Assad is a fool. What can we do in this rain, us and our children? Look, there's water in my tent. We're living like homeless people, and there's nothing we can do about it. The international community and the Arab world are completely silent. We need a lot of things here to be able to live a normal life. Logistically and financially, the burden of helping the refugees is growing heavier for Ankara, who wants other countries, especially the EU, to do more to help. Turkey has already done everything in its power to help these people. But on the other side of the border, there are many more Syrians living in horrific circumstances. The European Union and member states are helping a lot but not for the right reasons. They don't want to see Syrian refugees arriving on their own soil, and that's something we have to address right now. We have to ask how the EU and its member states can help. Germany did a bit recently, and Sweden, but it's all the states together who should commit to receiving refugees in their land. Meanwhile, the Turkish camps are at saturation point. But while violence continues on the other side of the border, refugees will continue to flood in. Some estimates expect 400,000 Syrians to be seeking shelter in Turkey by June next year. Alevis represent the largest religious minority in Turkey, a sect of Islam. They don't pray in mosques and they're allowed to drink alcohol. As a result, they are mostly viewed as heretics by the majority Sunni followers. And in a country led by the conservative AK party, some Alevis are starting to fear for their rights. Every Thursday evening, Alevi worshippers gather at this Jemevi on the outskirts of Istanbul to celebrate what they call the Jem. Music and dance feature heavily in the three-hour-long ceremony in praise of Allah and in honor of the Prophet Muhammad and His Holiness Ali. The Alevi sect is Turkey's biggest religious minority, representing more than a tenth of the country's population. Often they're labelled heretics. Alevis reject the five pillars of Islam, like praying five times a day and the Ramadan fast. Persecuted under the Ottoman Empire, Alevis say they still face discrimination. 
The state doesn't recognize Jamevis as places of worship. Just the other day, a minister said that if someone wants to pray, they can go to a mosque. They want to identify us with Muslims who pray in mosques. Mosques are not an alternative for us. Turkey's religious minorities say they don't receive fair treatment. Every year, the state grants $3 billion to the Directorate of Religious Affairs, one of the government's biggest budgets. Yet the cash is reserved exclusively for Sunni Islam, the money used for building mosques and paying imams. Meanwhile, minorities say they're ignored in new compulsory religious education classes. Up until this year, there was never a single word in school textbooks to explain the Alevi interpretation of Quranic verses. This meant that Islam was reduced to Sunni Islam exclusively. Radio and television stations Shem and Shem TV were created to raise awareness about the Alevi faith. Goksu Ongurin, a Sunni Muslim, has presented the news bulletin for several years now. Before joining the station, she says she knew very little about the Alevis. When I started working here, there were a lot of things I didn't know. I wasn't aware of the problems they face in Turkey. I didn't know what their fears were either. It's really important to have a radio station, because for years now, Alevis have been invisible, especially so in Turkey. They've been killed, persecuted. We need to make our voices heard. It's very important. In 2007, the European Court of Human Rights condemned Turkey for religious discrimination against the Alevis. Brussels says as long as minorities' rights are ignored, democratic progress in the country is impossible. Let's travel to Belgium now, home to an estimated 150,000 people of Turkish descent. While Belgium has a long tradition of immigration, studies have shown that the Turkish community remains one of the country's poorest and worst hit by unemployment. Our Brussels correspondent asked them what they expect from EU membership. Do Turks still want to join the EU? The question on everyone's lips during Ahmed Davutkalu's recent visit to the European Parliament in Brussels. The foreign affairs minister was clear about Turkey's path. I am sure one day uh, in European Parliament there will be Turkish members of Parliament. We don't know when, but we are sure that it will happen. His remarks differ from the Turkish Prime Minister, who's clearly fed up of Europe's procrastinating. The AKP party held its congress about a month ago and the EU is the 63rd of their 65 priorities. There is a complete disinterest in the EU, whether it is the economic crisis or EU-Turkish relations. To find out what Turks in Brussels think, we visit the Turkish quarter of San Jos. Here the European dream is a thing of the past. I want Turkey to remain independent. Do you agree? Uh, yes, I think I might leave with my husband. Because it's unbearable here. Europe doesn't accept us because we are Turks and we are Muslims. Turkey is doing well right now. Why join the EU? What's so interesting about Europe? The future is in Turkey. <laughs> and Europeans, what do they think about Turkey's accession? In another area of Brussels, responses are mixed. It would be a different culture that could teach us how to live together. I think Turkey is not secular enough, like it was in the past. I'm not sure what would be the advantage for them to join the EU. I think it would be a shame if they came into Europe. We can see the state of European countries today. Numerous Brussels-based Turks dream about going back home. Proof that due to the crisis, Europe has lost a lot of appeal. Well, it's time to meet a new guest in the program. Levent Erden chairs the Avas Advertising Group here in Turkey. He's also the presenter of a TV show entirely devoted to his city, Istanbul. We'll meet him up there. Very nice to meet you on the roof terrace of the tower, the tower where you work. This is an extraordinary view of, of Istanbul. This has to be the largest city in Europe. Yes, it is. And also it's one of the 
rarest is, if not the unique city, which is built on hills. We have 15 million people living in this city, but in uh, 1,000 hills. So we can see uh, the sea from everywhere. So just what you see behind me is just the intersection of the three seas, which is Marmara, the entrance of the Bosphorus, and the entrance of the Golden Horde. There are loads of cliches about Istanbul, but how would you describe your city? And it's like a 17 years old girl, thinking she knows too many things, but she's still very young, still changing almost every second. So it's quite fun to discover every day. But when you live and work within the city, sometimes the city is not faithful. You chose to show us your school. What a school, Galatasaray Lycée, where you spent most of your childhood. Why are you so attached to this place? I just got into this Lycée in 68 when I was 11. It's not only a school, but it's a way of life. Once you're here, you are always here. Officially, uh, the school started in uh, 1868, uh, just after Sultan Abdulaziz's visit to Europe. In France and in London, he was shown big schools, in fact, providing the state and the intelligentsia, the human raw material. So uh, this was the idea, and that's how the school started. And most courses are still taught in French. Yes, it's in French, because French was the lingua franca at that time. <laughs> For the last 40, 50 years, uh, you have exams in Turkey, countrywide, for most of the good schools. And it's a central exam, valid for everyone in Turkish. And in order to be in Galatasaray, you have to be in the first hundred, among uh, 900,000 to 1 million kids. So you really have the creme de la creme. I was here and of course we all had our own nicknames. Mine was Mara. Mara. Caveman, cave, to, simply. Caveman, why? Did you look no. like a caveman? No, I'm just, uh, today I am uh, really nice and handsome. At that time I had beard <laughs> till here and hair there, sometimes knots with some pearls and I was in love with that lady over there. Oh, well, that's your first love over there. Uh, yes, because I, at the age of 13, 14, I mean, just really desired, I mean, she is the only one where you can see everything you wonder. We are in the Egyptian bazaar, yeah. famous for its spices, Turkish delights, right? Yes. In fact, this is called Egyptian Bazaar because Egypt was the end of the road of Silk Road. And then by sea, all the products were coming to Istanbul to go to other European countries. And the spice were the most important thing coming from Far East to be used in pharmaceuticals and in food and all kind of other things. And Istanbul is becoming so modern, so oh. European. So this is really where you can feel the... The, the old the days, yeah. The this is uh, really the old days. Uh, that's why all the uh, films are made here, like Skyfalls of James Bond and other things, uh, just because they have in their mind the old days of Istanbul. So it's fun to see it. We walk through a hidden door next to the entrance of the bazaar and we're here in one of the oldest restaurants of Istanbul. The restaurant Pandeli is named after the chef and Pandeli was one of the three chefs of the uh, Ottoman Empire Palace. And just after the Republic, Pandeli had the permission to have a restaurant in uh, Egyptian bazaar. And the nice thing is, today of course those food you can find in many places, but this is the only place where you can find the way it was done almost 100, 200, 300 years ago with the same ingredients. It's a börek. Börek is a pastry filled with something, generally with cheese. But this one is very special. This very börek is filled with aubergine. You don't find it anywhere else. 
and with a slice of meat, slice of uh, doner on the top, which you never find somewhere else. So this is the type of food that the Sultan would find on his plate? Of course, he's going to find 10 times more than this, but yes. This surreal site was once the first power plant in the Ottoman Empire. Yes, with a developing empire, of course, you needed energy. So this was the very first power plant having the charcoal as raw material coming from Black Sea. And this factory uh, was effective uh, till uh, 15 years ago. And this place was converted into a university where you teach. Exactly. I teach integ integrated marketing communications in postgraduate studies. And the site is given to the university because when we had it, it was in poor conditions. So we renovated everything and transformed it into an energy and electricity museum next to a museum of modern art. What do your students tell you? Do they see their future in the European Union? They like to join the EU, no doubt, but now they are much less enthusiastic. Uh, first of all, like all the Turks, they feel much better than the 12 countries recently uh, adhered to the Union and also they don't understand why they are so rejected, mostly because of France and former French President Sarkozy. Is Turkey part of Europe? Yes, Turkey is, was and will be part of Europe, whether Europe accepts or not. I guess that will be our conclusion for today. Thank you very much, Levent Erden, for showing us your Istanbul. Thank you for watching this edition of Europe District. We were, of course, in Turkey. Next month, we'll travel to Bosnia-Herzegovina. So please stay with us on France 24.